Born in 1958 in Gadsden, Alabama, Major General Paul P.J. Johnson spent his childhood in Tennessee. Prior to entering the Air Force, he worked on a hog farm and earned a degree in agriculture from Murray State University, Kentucky. After receiving a commission from Officer Training School, Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, he successfully completed undergraduate pilot training at Laughlin Air Force Base, Texas, and was assigned to fly the A-10 Warthog. While serving in his first operational unit, Johnson demonstrated exceptional aviation skills and was selected to attend Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, his squadron deployed to King Fahd Royal Airport, Saudi Arabia, but Johnson's leadership directed him to continue his scheduled training. He rejoined his deployed unit after completing school as a distinguished graduate. Five days after the beginning of the Iraq War, then Captain Johnson and his wingman launched on a mission to locate the crew of a downed Grumman F-14 Tomcat. Despite poor radio signals, difficult terrain, and operating deeper inside enemy airspace than any A-10 before, Johnson successfully led the search and rescue effort that located the downed pilot. During this mission, he identified an enemy truck rapidly moving in the direction of the downed pilot. Just moments before the truck reached the pilot, Johnson successfully engaged the target, destroying the vehicle and securing the rescue. A few weeks later, he demonstrated his exceptional aviation skills when his aircraft was hit by enemy fire. Overcoming multiple system failures, Johnson managed to recover the badly damaged Warthog back to base. After the war, he applied his Desert Storm experience as an instructor at the Fighter Weapons School. Johnson also flew missions in support of Operation Northern Watch, influenced professional leaders as an Air War College professor in the Department of Strategy and International Security, and flew combat missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. He commanded at the squadron, group, and wing levels, and has more than 3,000 hours in the A-10. Johnson last served as the Director of Operational Capability Requirements with the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Requirements at Headquarters, United States Air Force in the Pentagon. He retired in 2016 as a Major General after more than 31 years of distinguished service. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming to the Gathering of Eagles stage Major General P.J. Johnson. Both of those young majors are former execs. And if you've had enough execs work for you, you know you sometimes wonder, is the exec working for me or am I working for the exec? So I'm okay right now. Um, they've been a delight to work with over this long haul. Um, I know where you are, I've been there. Your orders are in your hands, your household goods are packed, you're living out of a suitcase, Kids are ready to go, chomping at the bit, and you're sitting there thinking, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Been there. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, two things I've learned so far, listening to the other two, General Horner and Beast, is one is that the 10% rule is in effect. Uh, if you're not familiar, any story with 10% truth is fair game. And after listening to these two this morning, 10% rule is in effect. The second is, General Horner, his the CSAR question this morning was a really good question. And his observations, uh, I thought, were spot on about where we were with the CSAR force and, and AFSOC and the service roles and responsibilities, et cetera. I thought all of that was spot on. But then he got to the end and he was talking about some rescue involving F-16s. And I thought, really? After 26 years, he can't use the words A-10 in public? <laughs> Has it lasted that long? Uh, you may or may not know uh, his son John is a two-star in the Air Force, longtime A-10 pilot, horn dog. We go way back. Uh, that was a bitter pill for General Horner to swallow back in the day. Horn dog wanted to be an A-10 pilot, and uh, Dad didn't care for it. Uh, and 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 friends of the family would periodically uh, see Mary Jo and General Horner and say, "So how's John doing?" 
he died in a motorcycle accident. <laughs> After Desert Storm, General Harner obviously got his fourth star and went off to Air Force Space Command. And those of us in the tactical community kind of lost touch. We didn't know what was, where he was. And we'd see Horndog at the weapons school or wherever say, Horndog, where's your, what's going on with your dad? He died in a motorcycle accident. <laughs> What both General Horner and Beast talked about this morning about where we were in the 80s, pre-Desert Storm, is so true. Uh, we trained so hard. Uh, we trained, we were at Red Flag at least once a year. We were at Air Warrior normally twice a year. Green Flag every other year. Uh, we'd take 24 jets on a squad and we'd go to Europe for six months, even though we're sitting in Myrtle Beach. Go to the detachments over in Germany. Uh, we, we, uh, we were constantly taking four and six airplanes and just going off to an army fort for a week. I was gone 30% of the time before we ever got to Desert Storm, but it was training. And it was intense training. It was hard training. ORE, phase ones and phase two, every quarter, whether you needed it or not, oh, that was a root canal. Uh, we trained hard. Um, but as Beast mentioned about stealth, you know, is this stealth really going to work? We asked the same questions. Is, are our tactics really the right ones? Is our training really good? Are, are our systems really? You, you think about it. Uh, the F-16, the F-15C, the A-10, uh, the Strike Eagle were all unbloodied. All of them. Now, the Israelis have flown the F-15, got it. But for us, those were unbloodied systems. And, 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 and we didn't know. The uh, J-STARS was a developmental experimental system that got shoved into the war. So we wondered if all of those were going to work. Here's the other thing that was important that is an important difference. When I was a wing commander at DM eight years ago, uh, one, one of the things we did is we trained in UA-10 pilots. And I, I could walk into either one of those squadrons on any day and walk around and say, all the IPs with combat experience, raise your hand. All of them. Without fail. Without fail, every, every A-10 instructor pilot was a combat veteran. Some with multiple tours, uh, one of which had won a McKay Trophy for the outstanding flight of that year. So I had some long ball hitters as instructor pilots that are captains. When we deployed to Desert Storm, Desert Shield, when the squadron went, when the wing went, our combat experience was Sandy Sharp, the wing commander. Hammer and Hank Hayden, the Director of Operations. Rick McDowell, Commander of a Sister Squadron. And Ron Kurtz, our Ops Officer, who'd been an HH-53 driver in Southeast Asia and then transferred to Fixed Wing. Four. So we were all looking at each other thinking, I hope we've got this right. The other thing that we wondered about is what we were going to do. We're the cast pilots. Oh, we, we do close air support. That's what this is about. And then we discovered as part of the war plan, there's not going to be any ground fight for some number of weeks. So we're saying, what are we going to do? Well, as you read the notes in General Horner's uh, portion of the book, uh, he was not going to leave the Iraqi army untouched. So our job was to go in and attrit the Iraqi army. So we started day one, attriting the Iraqi army. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, as, you, as you saw, I didn't go with the squadron. Uh, as we were getting, the whistle finally blew and we were going to deploy out of Myrtle Beach. Squadron Commander Rick Schatzel said, come with me. Walk him back to his office. He sits down and says, the squadron's going to Saudi Arabia and you're not. Get in your car and go to Vegas. And he was right. I hated it. It was, yeah, was gut-wrenching, but it was the right thing because the squadron went to Saudi Arabia and started filling sandbags. Um, and I went to Saudi, I went to Nellis there for that time. Graduated, went home, Two days, kissed our new daughter Jessica, uh, had Christmas with Tricia, and Christmas Day, Christmas Day, I went to Dover uh, and then waited C5, waited two weeks for a C5 that was flyable uh, so I could get over to King 5. Sorry, those were C5As. Uh, I thought I'd get to Dover and see an empty ramp and the entire fleet was sitting on the ramp. Um, so I show up uh, in, in country on New Year's Day and my squadron mates never let me forget it. Uh, because they'd been there for the whole thing. Two weeks later, the war starts, um, and I don't do CAS. I don't even do the interdiction of treating the Iraqi forces. My first combat sortie is offensive counter-air. What? 
uh, as Beast alluded to, the Pavlos the night before had taken the Apaches in and they had knocked a corridor down for early warning radar sites. We continued doing that over the next few days. So we were going up along the border and knocking out early warning radars or their comm nose just knocking down the picket fence all the way across southern Iraq. So I thought, I've never done OCA before. I uh, never even trained to do OCA before. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. You want me to hit a target that doesn't move and you're gonna give me pictures of what the target looks like. I got this. Um, and so that's what I did for the first couple of days. The first thing I wanna talk about is really the flexibility of air power. We talk about it, but here's what you may not understand. It's just how good we are at it. We're so good at it, we take it for granted. General Horner alluded to it when he's out at NTC and all of these disparate units show up Guard, active, different services, they show up and they're suddenly got to create a force the next day, and they do, because they've been red, doing red flag for years. Uh, we, we take for granted the flexibility that we have, but it's ingrained in us. Somebody said once that the only truly American music form is jazz, and jazz is fundamentally improvisation. We do jazz. Doesn't mean it's not disciplined. Doesn't mean that people don't have parts. Hello, JC. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> just, just had a flashback. Everyone has roles to play, but you improvise along the way. Uh, and the first experience with that was when the scud hunt kicked up. And everybody was frightened about the scuds, and we're all doing scud hunting. Well, scud hunting is armed recce. Scud hunting is armed recce, and we trained to do armed recce. Uh, CSAR. We had trained to do CSAR. Uh, the, the A-10 was the fixed wing legacy of the A-1 Sky Raider from Southeast Asia. Uh, and there's nothing an A-10 pilot wanted more than on Friday to be able to slap on a Sandy 1 name tag and go out and fire a Sandy. Yeah, tra yeah Trash is giving me the look. That, that was the heat, to be a Sandy guy. Uh, but CSAR was in trouble in the United States Air Force. The Air Rescue Service, we had a detachment at Myrtle Beach, a couple of H-3s, and we had a detachment, but, but they were on a slippery slope because Mother Mac was not taking care of them. Uh, and the force was dwindling and the force was in trouble. Meanwhile, AFSOC is standing up with incredibly capable Pavlos, MH-53Js, that are just amazing machines, but we weren't on the same page. Uh, their concept was about infill and exfill, night, covert, precise, known location. We grew up in a day CSAR task force where well, here, here's the analogy. There's a different way to raise a farmer's hen house. One way is to sneak under the back fence, sneak in a hen house without waking anybody up, grab three of the chickens and leave and nobody knows. That's a good way to raise a hen house. Our perspective in the A-10 was we go crashing through the front door, hold a nice knife at the farmer's throat and say, I'm about to raid your hen house. You got any problems with that? And that was the CSAR task force. And that was really born out of the A-1 Sky Raiders. It was, we dare you to mess with us. Uh, I talked to an old guy, Tommy Lyon, uh, A1 Sky Raider. I asked, what happened when the, when the SA-7 showed up? How did you deal with the SA-7s? We were pissed and driven. Didn't bother us. So I said, how did you deal with the SA-7 threat? Did you bring in the big strikes? Did you bring in the F-105? He said, no, no, no. The SA-7s were for us. CSAR got to be a psychological event as much as a tactical event. And that's the way we approached it in the A-10. Well, again, that's a mismatch from what the payloads were doing. But nevertheless, we found ourselves doing it. Didn't want to do it. Our philosophy was, if I'm going to get up at 0430 and be awake all day, let me fly the airplane. If you're not going to let me fly the airplane, let me stay in my rack. CSAR alert, you're getting up pre-flighting an airplane and then sitting on your hands all day. So we weren't keen on doing that. But what we discovered on the CSAR mission when I flew it, 8.8 .8 hours, long story, not enough time here, uh, I learned of the power of the Sandy call sign. When you check down on the radio and you talk to Yukon, the AWACS, and I said, AWACS, this is Sandy 5-7, I need a tanker. Where do you want him? Yukon, Sandy 5-7, we need an Eagle cap. Roger, five minutes, he's on the radio. Sandy 5-7, this is Eagle 1, where do you want me? Oh no, I'm just a dumb hog guy. You just set up the bar cap where you need to. But nobody said no to Sandy because we remembered. We had enough of the Vietnam guys left that we remembered what CSAR was from their day. And everybody, want, everybody wanted to play, 
really wanted to play in a seesaw, and nobody would back away from the task. Not only are we flexible, we put teams together faster than anybody. Call sign, frequency, rendezvous point, tasker, code word, whatever, off to the races. Off we go. And we did that every day. We do it all the time now. It's, all, it's embedded in what we do. I'm coming off the survivor's location of overflow my bingo. Uh, I'm not going to make it to RR, the divert base way out west. And I said, hey, Wax, I need the tanker. Roger, your nose, 126 miles. No, I need the tanker to come to me. Calls the tanker, 15,000 feet, fifth day of the war, broad daylight, wading into Iraq, comes bebopping in. I get on him, and he's still pointed north. <laughs> Why don't we turn south now? Um, three times, he comes inside Iraq to get me. Never bats an eye. On the battle damage day, talk about that in a minute, I'm coming out with a beat-up airplane. I'm stuck below the weather at about 6,000 feet. Weather's above me uh, with a messed-up airplane. Uh, and I realize uh, right fuel tank got ruptured. It's messed up. Fuel gauges, none of them make sense. Nothing's adding up right. Just based on the wing that my that fuel my wingman's got, what's going on? Okay, let's get a little bit of gas and get home. Call for a tanker. Uh, weather's layered all the way up to the 30s. The only tanker without chicks in tow, again, is a KC-10 sitting at 30,000 feet. And AWACS again says, emergency, we need fuel right now. Here's where he is, 6,000 feet AGL behind him. And so a KC-10 rolls it up and slices through the stack. Just comes rolling through. <clears throat> and then I'm sitting there trundling along with a boot full of rudder, smoking along at 190 knots, and I see an a KC-10 sliding by about a mile off my starboard side, and I say, well, that's not going to work. And I see him start to roll his flaps. Okay, been to this rodeo. It's time for hum A-10 public humiliation while he tries to get slow. That doesn't work. I see him roll his slats. Yeah, yeah, more public humiliation for the A-10s. KC-10 get, getting slow enough. And then I see him throw down his gear at 6,000 feet. I said, no, I've never seen that before. And then he gets himself slow, we stabilize, match speeds, he sucks the gear up, and then I pull behind him. I've got an awesome letter, handwritten letter from the boomer to his father, who is a retired colonel. And it's a six-page handwritten letter about that mission from the boomer's perspective. It's priceless. It's priceless. And, uh, and I, 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 I snuggle up behind the tanker, and tankers now, so I can have a little bit of throttle, tankers at 175 knots in a KC-10. KC-10 drivers, anybody volunteering to do that one? So his deck, deck angle is such, and my problems are such that the boom is out of limits. The boom is out of its envelope, so the boom has to go on override. I'm out of right hydraulics, so I can't latch. So he's got a stiff boom refuel. So I, I snuggle up behind him. I'm in a 15 degrees of left bank because all the damage is on the right. Full left boot of rudder, can't latch, and he stiff booms me, refuels me long enough to get enough gas, and then I back off and off we go. Uh, we can be tribal in our Air Force. Sometimes that's pretty good. We like to talk smack about each other. When I was at the weapons school, whenever we would sit down with our bros in the F-15 division, there was always a bet. How long will it take before the Viper bashing begins? Uh, and then it goes back and forth. You know, a friend of mine, Mobile Homes, now the ACC commander, always talks smack about the hog. Hog popping is the sport of kings. We get very tribal, and usually it's good. Sometimes it gets to have a little bite to it. Uh, but I tell you, in the storm, there weren't many tribes because nobody backed away. Nobody questioned whether or not they were going to play. Nobody wondered if they wanted to play. Great conversation between an OV-10 Bronco and one of my squadron mates, Greg Henderson. The Bronco's up in eastern Kuwait working below the weather. And we don't like being below the weather because we're highlighted, probably about 7,000 feet. Hendo's holding just south of the border, talking to the OV-10 Bronco, trying to figure out what's the threats, what's the threat level like, how big is it, how intense is it, where's the AAA, where are the SAMs, is it good enough to come in? And finally the Bronco says, look. I'm in here, are you coming or not? Be right there. 
Everybody's willing to do whatever it took. We put teams together quickly, and we are incredibly flexible. It's in our DNA, and don't ever let it roll out of our DNA. Be careful about letting tactics fall out of the playbook just because they're not the newest fad. Sometimes tactics do need to be updated, and at the age of stealth, they get updated significantly. But be leery of throwing away old tactics. Because the CSAR executed, we pulled a page straight out of Southeast Asia. I used a daisy chain. I used a hover cover. I did UHF electronic search. You could have slapped a propeller on the front of my airplane and put an A1 Sky Raider in it, and he would have known exactly what we were doing. And oh, by the way, that Pavlo MH-53 started out life as an HH-53. And I've often wondered how much Southeast Asia time that MH-53 had on it. Tom Trask, by the way, was the aircraft commander on that airplane and just retired as Lieutenant General Tom Trask out of SOCOM. Great guy. Learned a few other things. One was I had to spend two weeks in Riyadh in the black hole. And one night I stumbled into the ops floor just talking to the A-10 duty officers about the taskings. As I stumbled in, I thought, something's different here. There's a level of intensity that I'm not accustomed to seeing at 2 o'clock in the morning. And bottom line, it was the night of Kafji. And what I saw that night is just a slick wing captain was, I saw the JFAC realized. I saw because of theater-wide command and control and the authority of a JFAC, I saw mass on demand. If you don't know the story, it's when the Iraqis tried to assemble some sort of armored force and move on a village down on the Iraq-Kuwaiti border right in the corner of southeastern Kuwait, and JSTARS caught it with a moving target MTI radar, and everything fell in on them. If 15 e is tasked for the east, never mind, re-roll them to the west, or vice versa. A-10's going to the kill box? Nope, send them to Kafji. Where are the B-52s? They're about an hour south. Re-roll them. They're going to Kafji. The theater, the theater's worth of air power fell on Kafji because a JFAC had the authority and a JFAC had the command and control capability to make it happen. That was an awesome thing to watch from, a, from the safety of the command center. The other thing is, is, as was noted this morning, General Holder noted this morning, the Iraqi army sitting on the front was a conscript army. If you looked across the Kuwaiti front and the Kuwaiti along the Saudi border starting on the east and going west, that was the Iraqi infantry force. And that was the conscript army extending on to Saudi Arabia. The Republican Guard was sitting north of them. The reason the Republican Guard was north of them is to keep them from deserting because they didn't want to be there. First of all, Beast and others like him had disconnected them from their higher headquarters starting on night one. Those poor guys on the front had no clue what was going on because there was no C2, there was no IADs, there were no commanders in the know as what was going on. But because the Republican Guard was behind them, they were stuck. Nobody to surrender to. So what I saw when the ground fight started were a couple of things. First of all, first of all, I flew three, count them, three close air support sorties. That's it. I employed ordnance on one of them. Two notable ones. One, we're supporting the Army Cav Regiment. And as I was talking to my, my Army brother last night, uh, this one an Armored Cav Regiment was an absolute beast. It was a division without the logistics tail, and they could move. Uh, all they were doing was pulling Iraqis out of their slit trenches. All they were doing was, was surrendering. That's all they were doing. Nobody was firing a shot. And I'm supporting them up here talking to the ALO on the radio, another weather deck. I'm down at about 3,000 feet. And the slit trenches are this way, the, the second ACR and the Bradleys are moving this way, and we're holding back here, doing this little figure eight parallel to the flight, watching what's going on. And all the, the, the Iraqis were just thrilled to surrender. There are stories about MPs taking a roll of concertina wire and filling an area about half the size of the auditorium, putting a couple hundred of Iraqis in, giving them a pallet full of MREs and say, don't go nowhere. And they come back in eight hours, and there's 500 Iraqis inside the concertina wire. So these guys are surrendering, and I'm sitting here looking at this. This is, a, this is so cool. 
man, I'd love to get a picture of this. So I get this brilliant idea. I'm going to call up my IR Maverick, and I'm going to turn on my HUD. i got 30 minutes of videotape, and I'm going to film this. And so I peel back about four miles, and I turn inbound with my Maverick called up, my IR Maverick, and I'm looking up here. And you can see the little racky stick figures coming out on the IR scene. You can see the Bradleys coming around. Hey, this is really cool. And then suddenly I see the Bradleys' rooster tails of sand kick out, and they go accelerating around, and I look up, and all the Iraqis are running. turn away, and I called the ALO. I said, uh, did I do that? He said, yeah. They're kind of scared of you guys. We'd appreciate you not doing that again. <laughs> Got it. So please understand, when, when General Horner talks about don't draw too many lessons about Desert Storm, let's not draw too many lessons about the army that we faced. It was a conscript army that largely did not want to be there. Secondly, didn't understand what was going on around them was totally disconnected from their higher headquarters and were really welcome for the opportunity to surrender to somebody instead of running into the Republican Guard at their 6 o'clock. So let's keep that in mind. The other thing about the cast fight was the day I was supporting the Brit uh, Armored Division, the Desert Rats, talking to this magnificent Brit ground fact. We give you a PAR to the target. But on this day, again, if you remember, Saddam had lit all the Kuwaiti oil wells on fire creating this huge natural disaster. And mo with the normal weather patterns, that smoke blew through Kuwait and then got pushed out into the Gulf. But on this day, the weather backed up, the winds shifted, and it was pushing back into Kuwait and into eastern Saudi Arabia, eastern Iraq. And, and this was a scuzz layer, maybe 100 feet thick, that kind of hugged the ground. And you could look straight down through the, the cloud, through the oil, and see the ground. But if you got any lateral positioning, you can't see anything. So John Whitney and I, we have to duck down below this stuff. And so we, uh, we're working 100 to 200 feet AGL. We think the deck is about 300 feet, maybe a mile viz. So Witt's having to stay pretty close. And, and we're coming up just to the leading edge of the Brit flot, and he's saying the tanks are right over here, and we're getting the clearance, and we're shooting Mavericks uh, into these uh, Iraqi T-55s. We call him a spike maverick. The joke is that you'd fly over the tank and scrape the maverick off your pylon as you flew over him. Uh, the motor's still burning on the rat maverick as it hits. So these are spike shots. And, uh, and, and I'd fly, and as I'd pull, pull off, I'm puking flares out of my airplane. I'm about 100 to 200 feet. I don't know. And Witt says, PJ, you're bouncing flares off their heads. And just like B says, 15 to 20 Iraqis in the middle of the desert clustered together are doing this to my A-10 as it goes by. Again, they didn't want to be there. The other point was those tanks were empty. What we had done with precision-guided munitions, first of all, PGM showed up in Southeast Asia. So we were using PGMs in Southeast Asia, but often against operational targets, bridge abutments, uh, railroad viaducts, that sort of thing. We, and, and again, even in Desert Storm, you're going against IOCs and, and, and IOCs and, and the AT&T building and operational strategic targets. We were using PGMs on the battlefield against vehicles. Well, we had always trained to do that with Mavericks. Uh, I, I take umbrage when people say the A-10 was not a PGM shooter in Desert Storm. We shot more Mavericks than anybody else by a long shot. Uh, and the Maverick was a PGM dating back to the 70s. We've been plinking tanks for weeks before the F-111 started plinking tanks with LGBs. So we had been shooting tanks day after day after day after day and night after night after night. And what they'd figured out was an armored vehicle is not protection. An armored vehicle is a coffin. And I think that's had long-term impact. My opinion, why does ISIS run around in Toyota trucks with kids in the back end? Because they don't have the guts to get into an APC or a tank. Because we can fix that problem. The opponent knows not to mass on the battlefield. The opponent knows not to gather vehicles into a concentration. The opponent knows to bury himself into the civilian populace. The opponent knows to drive vehicles that look like civilian vehicles. Because if it's an armored force, we know how to fix that problem. And I think we demonstrated that in Desert Storm. <clears throat> One of the questions that typically gets asked up here is about leadership lessons. And, and, and I'll go ahead and answer that. Now, um, as you go out and you assume positions of leadership, somewhere along the line, you're going to have to decide 
how much leash do you give your folks? How tight do you hold the leash and how loose do you let the leash run? The answer is it depends. Uh, and this isn't just about aviation. Security forces, this is about your cops. Battlefield airmen, uh, it's about your, uh, your ETACs and your ground facts uh, that may be displaced from your location. How much leash do you give them? Is the example I give from Sandy Sharp, and he was mirroring the, the guidance from General Horner. <clears throat> we got into a point with the A-10 when we were trying to attrit the Iraqi army that we were strafing too much. And when we, got, when we started strafing, we got stupid, including me. Uh, we do repeated passes with the strafe, and, every, and, and high angle strafe on an A-10 is an energy losing maneuver. It's like doing a clover leaf in an old T-37. Each leaf gets lower. And we do a high angle strafe pass and shoot, and you come up, you get slow, and you roll in a little bit lower. Next pass, you roll in a little bit lower, and before you know it, you get bagged. And so guys were getting shot strafing. And so General, uh, Colonel Sandy Sharp finally said, done. There will be no more strafing. And telling an 18 guy that he's not going to strafe anymore is like taking away breakfast. You've got to be kidding me. But here was his intent. We started the fight with 144 A-10s at King Fod. And his intention was to go to the ground fight with 144 A-10s. And every morning as you walk in, oh dark 30, you go into the squad and the first thing you do is read the battle staff directives. What's the latest guidance? What are the latest spin changes? Is there anything? And that's when we got those restrictions. You're not gonna strafe. Uh, reserve the IR Mavericks for the night flyers, or all releases are going to be of 10,000 AGL, whatever it is. And it, it just felt co so constraining, so constraining. And then we walk in the day of the ground fight start, and we flip the page, and it's like all restrictions are lifted. You will fly as low as required, you will stay in the target area as long as required, and you will fly in any weather you deem suitable as the flight lead to execute your mission. And that's an example of there's a time to have a leash and there's a time to let the leash run. And Colonel Sharp, he turned the leash loose. And in fact, and this is a story I've been told, I can't verify its authenticity, but there was a really bad weather day, uh, part of the day, and, and Sandy Sharp put us on weather hold. He just put the wing on weather hold. We're not flying, it's too bad up there. And I'm told there was a brief phone call from Riyadh <laughs> And Sandy Sharp was instructed to let the captains figure that out. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Get your ass in the air was the quote. The point was, let the captains figure it out. The leash was off because we were there to do whatever is required for our coalition and our ground brethren. Um, I agree that we need to be careful how many lessons we take from Desert Storm. But what we did learn, in my opinion, is one, I think air power came of age. I think the promise of air power, or what sometimes was the overpromise of air power, was in many ways realized. Uh, I think the necessity for an air component commander and for theater wide C2 was made manifest. Uh, but at the same time, we remember who we were fighting. Uh, we were not fighting the A team, and depending on their capability, we weren't even fighting the B team. So let's be careful of the lessons we walk away from it. But, but here, here's a pitch to you. Uh, I like reading David McCulloch, historian. Uh, he's a popular historian. And I'm reading a book right now. It's, it's, a, it's a collection of essays and speeches. It's called The American Spirit. And, and in one of those, he talks about the value of history. And, uh, and, and he talks about we're guilty of, of making history painful as a subject. Uh, and, and he says, at the end of the day, history is stories. History is stories. And, and, and the kudos I give to ACSC uh, over the years is GOE is about bringing a bunch of old folks in and letting us tell stories. And here's my pitch to you. You've got your stories. There are people in this room that have done incredible things in combat don't hide your stories. Don't sit on your stories. 
uh, find venues and places? Is it in the club? Is it in the lounge? Keep it informal. Keep it relaxed. Keep it laid back. But share the stories. Uh, what has happened... When we deployed out of Myrtle Beach, um, when, and I did not deploy, uh, our youngest wingman was Rob Sweet, Sweetness. Sweetness had had his mission ready check ride the week before. Mission ready one week before we got in the jets. And so Rick Schatzel, he's looking at the lineup and Ron Kirch are looking at the deployment lineup and they say mission ready pilot number four, Rob Sweet. And his flight commander sees the list and he goes running into the school and the commander said, boss, uh, are you sure you want sweetness in the lineup? He says, you recommended him to be mission ready and I signed off on the form eight. Is he ready or not? He says, he's got an unaccomplished task. What's that? He's never done night refueling. Well, he's about to do four of them on the way to Marone, Spain. <laughs> Put him on Steve Phyllis's wing, who was the senior IP in the squadron and the weapons officer at the time, and SIF will get him across. So think about this as, as commanders and leaders. When you look at the young pup, the person that looks like they're wet behind the ears, and it comes time to make the decision, are they combat mission ready or they're not? Are they ready to go or they're not? Are they ready to deploy or they're not? Make the call. If they're ready, then let them go. Well, you're ready, but maybe not this deployment. Well, yeah, I know you're mission ready, but we really want to put a more experienced guy on it. I, I, I knew of wings that stacked the deck. I knew of wings that the lead squadron flew with the entire Stanavel shop, the entire weapons shop, and all the IPs from both squadrons. I'm forever thankful to Sandy Sharp that says, are they mission ready? Stick their butts in the airplane and get it going. Think about that as you're a leader and, and you're thinking about those that are mission ready and not. Uh, we have come so far with our training. <clears throat> this was always our fear in Canada art. We would go out and we do armed overwatch. And at some point, things may get warm and, some, and you need to stay there. You need your presence. They want to see A-10s, want to hear A-10s. But you got to go to the tanker. And we do yo-yo ops. Standard. It's a standard Afghan thing. Probably Iraq as well. One guy stays, the other goes to the tanker. Gets off the tanker, comes back the other guys. And so you just yo-yo to the tanker. On this particular one, the problem was the wingman, his first ever flight in a United States Air Force airplane without an IP. Combat mission check ride, comes over, he's on his orientation flight, and there's a tick. And they're doing yo-yo ops. Okay. This youngster drops both of his LGBs, drops his JDAM, shoots 750 rounds out of the gun, troops in contact, danger close, and the flight leads on the tanker. We didn't have the heart to tell him that's probably the best sword he'll ever fly in his life. <laughs> but myself and, and, and Trashman Hicks, who's the OG, and, and the squadron commander, and then the vice wing commander, who's, uh, we, we all look at each other and say, that's the RTU. That's what they get in the RTU because every one of those RTU instructors is a combat veteran and they know the standards that we train to. Our, our Air Force is highly stressed. As General Horner said, we were on the crest of the readiness wave. We had 95% MC rates on the hogs. Uh, in, in those days, you would come out of the three-day surge and the jets were flying better than they did on the first day. We had, we had new equipment, everything was awesome, the readiness was magnificent, but I will tell you this, you are better trained than we were. You are better prepared than we were because you've been there, done that. And uh, tell the stories to each other and don't let them slip away. Okay, I'm gonna hush, I'm gonna stop, and then uh, we'll throw it open to Q&A. Okay, and I'm gonna let the exec back on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we'll open up for questions. If you have a question, please make your way over to the microphones located on the side of the walls. Hey, sir, I'm uh, Major Branovich. I'm a Jolly Pilot. Um, I just had a question in regard to CSAR. Uh, as you know, we're uh, replacing our aging HH HH60s with more HH60s. Um, and we're looking kind of... Aging, overweight, overgrossed HH60s with new yep. overweight, overgrossed HH60s. I'm on it. I'm Roger on that. it. 
Uh, when we're looking forward uh, against a threat, uh, more of a near peer peer threat, looking maybe China or Russia, uh, and we're going to plan to bring our guys home uh, in a contested A280 environment like that, uh, what do you see as the best path forward for uh, combat rescue? Um, I, I, I think we, first of all, don't throw away what we've done. Um, secondly, let's not be afraid to look at the approach that AFSOC had for years. Th this is an emergency covert exfil. Uh, the idea that I'm going to come in in the dead of the night, nobody knows I'm there, and I'm going to go to the known location, pick, th pick the guy up, and come back out. But again, you're looking at bookend approaches, and neither one is going to exclusively be the answer. In the A280 construct, you bring up the challenge we always had in teaching CSAR academics. We talked about low threat SAR and high threat SAR. What's the threat? Low threat, high threat, medium threat. Depends on which member you're talking to. Uh, what might be low threat for me, might be medium threat for you, might be high threat for the survivor. Or what's low threat for the survivor might be unsurvivable for you and for me. And so I think we're going to have to go back to some things we thought about in the European context. Aviators are going to know how to do E&E &E because nobody's coming for three or four days. Nobody can survive it to get there for three or four days. If, if it's an F-22 that got shot down, well, who else can get there? Um, and, and so I think we're going to need to back up and take a holistic approach about what, what is survivable, what is expected, what is required, and what is doable. I also need to go back, as General Horner said, the doctrinal issues of who, whose game is it. If it's a sailor off the boat, then the, then, then the Navy owns it unless they can't do it. Uh, if it's the soft guys, they own it unless they can't. So we, we need to be careful. And we got into this in ACC where we thought, we do CSAR for everybody. Not so fast. It's a service responsibility to, until they cannot. Um, but, but I think we're going to have to recognize the limitations there will be on CSAR in certain places. And on the other hand, the risks that we'll be willing to accept to execute a CSAR. Remember the 117 in Bosnia? Who was the rescue vessel vehicle? It was an A-10. The A-10 sitting inside the SA-3 threat ring that shot down the F-117. I've known A-1 guys sitting in a hammerhead getting ready to launch a four ship of A-1s and they're getting a call, we've had an F-4 shot down a route pack six. And they're thinking, and they want me to go there? Um, there will come a time, and, and General Short has talked about this, who is the Allied Force Commander. There will come a time when it takes the JFAC to make the call of, we can't do it, the threat is too high. Or he's going to say, he or she's going to say, I've got to do it. I've got to accept the risk of trying to go get somebody and tell them we're serious. And then I think we're going to have to think, as I've discussed, the spectrum of CSAR concepts. Is it going to be, I'm going to sneak under the farmer's fence, raid his hen house, and nobody's going to know, or I'm going to go crashing in the front door and dare anybody to get within five miles of me? I don't know the right answer. Uh, you're, you're going to get to figure it out. Uh, and what, what we will have to do is, as, and again, the A-10s looks like the A-10s are staying around. That's great. Um, it, we, we've got to get comfortable with working with something other than the traditional rescue aircraft, that being the A-10. What role can other airplanes fill in this? Uh, met a guy, Arnie Clark. I flew the first A-10 CSAR ever, 8.8 .8 hours, receiving Air Force Cross. Arnie Clark, member of the same fighter wing, 354th fighter wing, flew the first A-7 CSAR in Southeast Asia, 8.8 .8 hours, received an Air Force Cross. And we talked about tactics differences. Tactics. And I learned the most important thing for us, what's your loadout at Sandy 1? Do you have CBU? Did you have GP bombs? What kind, did you have API? What kind? He said, I had a full gun and I had four pods of rockets and three tanks of gas. I thought, huh? He said, Sandy One is command and control. So break down the roles, and then you figure out who does what and how they do it. Sandy One is command and control. Sandy Two is fax car. Sandy Three and Four. Some of those roles are timeless. Some of those roles have to change. But this is going to get really tough 
in some places in an A280 environment, and at the end of the day, the JFAC's gonna make the call, yay or nay. And it may be go, even when it doesn't look like the best option to go. We may have no choice. Don't know if that helps. <laughs> go figure it out. <laughs> Who else? Sorry, I have a question. Having commanded the 451st Air Expeditionary Wing in Kandahar in 2010, 2011, what were some of the similarities and differences that you saw from Desert Storm, and what were some of the lessons learned that you were able to apply? Um, differences? Um, we had a reserve unit show up because there were political pressure at home for them to show up. And I questioned whether or not they were ready to show up. I never asked that question in Kandahar. Never. If I could tell the difference in an airman on the flight line between reserve component and active duty component, something was wrong. At the, at, at the front end, at the pointy end, it is transparent. It is absolutely transparent. The capabilities, the skills, the professionalism between the reserve component and the active. So that's a huge difference in my mind from what we saw in Desert Storm. Um, the preparate, <clears throat> the ability to do rotations. Uh, I was just astounded. Uh, at, at Kandahar and at Bagram, I would watch the Army take a month to do a rip toa. Uh, and again, you're talking about a division, so you're talking about 15,000 soldiers or more, and you're talking about a different beast and a different animal. But I would watch uh, an AEF rotation, and it's a 24-hour thing. Uh, you know, an airman comes, an airman for the LRS walks off the C-17, high fives the other LRS airman who's walking on the C-17, and we're done. Or people walk into a work center at POL that have never seen each other before and say, well, I'm from Mountain Home. Yeah, I'm from Beale. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from Eglin. They've never worked before and said, well, I'm the senior master sergeant, so I guess I'm the OIC, C, uh, NCOIC. Done. We have the team. The team is built. We go to work, and we, we don't bat an eye. We would do A-10 swap outs, and A-10 swap outs at Kandahar were dicey because we didn't have the ramp space. So, so we would have uh, four A-10s coming up the boulevard to cover a TOT, and four A-10s departing down the boulevard to go back to the deed. And, uh, and then they come off the TOT and they come land. So it was a very much a ballet dance. We never, we never reduced the number of lines we would fly. Um, and so the ability to do rotations consistently uh, without a drop in mission effectiveness, I just thought was enormously impressive. Uh, now, on the flip side, I remember General Schwarzkopf and General Horn saying, there be no rotation. We're, d we're here till this is done. And although that was a downer for morale, once everybody got past it, it meant, hey, we're here till this gets fixed. And that had had a great effect on people. It did, had a great effect on people. Okay, then let's get on with it. Let's get it done. And there's none of this, I'm approaching the end of my tour, so I mentally start checking out. So I mentally take my, my, my eye off the ball because I'm two days away or two weeks away or two sorties away. There's none of that. We're here till we're done. To me, that was a big difference. And, and, and I don't know the right answer, but as a commander, you gotta watch that. You've got to watch people taking their eye off the ball as they get to the end of a rotation and, and they just want to get home. And you've got to keep everybody sprinting to the finish line. That's, that's a leadership challenge, but, but, but I think we do well at it. Good afternoon, General. Thank you for sharing your stories with us today. Major Newcomer, Flight 18. Um, I had a question. Out, out of all the Eagles, uh, seven are, are pilots. The other one's a, a gunner, an observer. A lot of ops folks on the Eagles today. Um, I'm going to uh, Airfield operations guy, op support. There's a lot of mission support, uh, medical, maintenance, other folks in the room. I was wondering, for, based on your experience in Desert Storm, what was, what was the biggest contribution that the non-operators provided to you being successful in, in, in your mission? <clears throat> when I came back from my first sortie, uh, we landed at a FOL, King Khalid Military City, and it was just Gas, gas, bullets, bombs, and you take off and you go fly again. Uh, and we landed the first day, and it was just a beehive of, uh, of activity. And as I cleared the runway and I started taxiing down the taxiway, 
and you had, we call them ICTs, integrated combat turns. You pull in, you never shut down, you get your bombs, you pull out, you go get gas, you never shut down, and then you just go again. It was awesome. Um, and as you're taxiing down the taxiway, we see these weapons load crews with pieces of cardboard and magic markers as cheap bombs here, never used before, get them here. They wanted you to pull into their spot. They wanted you to get their bombs before you went back into the fight. When my airplane got shot up, <clears throat> the crew chief was Sergeant Willie Wilson. He was up at the FOL. The assistant crew chief was Sergeant uh, Eric Staniland. Uh, Sergeant Staniland told me later, I asked him, first of all, that was my airplane, by the way, that got shot. And so he talked about being in trouble with the crew chief. That was me. I asked him how he felt about that. He said, when he went to get to the airplane, what was he thinking? He said, I felt like I was going to the morgue to identify a member of my family. And he said that with a straight face. We almost pushed her off in the ditch, but they decided there was a battle damage repair team out of Sacramento and said, let us do an experiment here, and they replaced the wing on the airplane. Airplanes in three sections. They had to replace the center section and the right section. It took them 30 days to replace the wing on the airplane. What happens to an airplane when it sits for 30 days? Canbird. If it wasn't welded to the airplane, it was yanked off to be a spare part for some other airplane. Well, as the engineers are rebuilding the airplane, Everything's getting pulled off, UHF, TACAN, oil pressure gauges, throttle grip, everything's getting yanked off the airplane. Well, it's not the battle damage repair guy's responsibility to do that. It's a crew chief's job to fix that and get all that back on. Well, they repaired the airplane, but now Eric Staniland has to put the airplane back together with all of those cannibalized parts. And the war is over now. War's done. We're waiting on tankers to get out of Dodge. And one night, Colonel Rupright, who is the deputy commander for maintenance, an old F-4 Southeast Asia back cedar. Uh, he comes walking through the hangar and he looks up and, and in the clamshell is my A-10. And what he sees is two feet and two legs sticking out of the cockpit. Eric Staniland is up there upside down in the cockpit putting some part back on. He says, Sergeant Staniland, are you ready to go home yet? He says, not until my airplane goes home. All airmen need is a sense of possession about their job, whatever their job is. They need a sense that their job is important and that it's theirs, and then we get out of their way. And if those of us wearing the bags ever are so thoughtless as to demean the airmen that don't wear bags, I hope they keep packing your chute right. We put our lives in their hands every day. Another mission I flew, this one was, south, uh, was, was Kandahar, <clears throat> doing armed overwatch. A small convoy, getting ready to do a village visit, is on the banks of the Helmand River up in the foothills of the mountains. They stop. Uh, the village is deathly quiet. Uh, the captain steps out of his, uh, of his uh, um, um, MRAP, wants a better look because you can't see out of those things. And uh, he steps around to the front of the vehicle and takes about three steps and steps on an IED. Uh, I'm talking to the ground fact, the ALO, who's sitting in the convoy, he's actually in the lead vehicle. And all we know is the ALO says, got to go, and he's off the mic. And so now we got nobody to talk to. We didn't know what had happened. The ALO gets out of the truck and does self-aid buddy care on the captain. Slaps the tourniquet on the leg, probably saves his life. Then we start the golden hour. And now we're calling uh, the, the, the Casavac UH-60 out of Terran Calp. He's there in about 20 minutes. Picks up the captain. Captain's back in Terran Calp in about 20 minutes. So he's in the hands of a field surgeon within 40 minutes. He's messed up. So they bring one of our HC-130s out of Bastion. Again, HC-130s out of, out of davis Monthan, Comes in Terran Calp with, with a CCAT team on board. Nurses, medical professionals, PJs. Load him up and get him down to the Roll 3 Hospital at Kandahar. Gets down to the Roll 3 Hospital. I will tell you, if, if, if I had been hurt or injured in Afghanistan and I had a choice between being teleported to Johns Hopkins or the Roll 3 Hospital in Kandahar, I go to the Roll 3 Hospital in Kandahar. If there was a surgical specialist, they had it. Canadian, Australian, Brit, U.S., didn't matter. They were side by side. After I finished flying that sortie, I went back and I landed 
and uh, <clears throat> did my paperwork, drove over to the roll three. I wanted to go see the soldier. And I slipped in the back door, and I walk in, and usually if you went in the front door, you had to check your weapon, you had to clear your weapon and put it in the vault and get a receipt and all of that. I just slipped in the back door. So the Air Force One star walks in in a flight suit, and he's still toting his weapon, and everybody kind of looks, and, and they suddenly start asking me if they can help. And I said, I need, I'd like to see the captain that came in, stepped on an IED, come over, and he's, out of re he's in recovery. And I step over, and I'm clustered around by about three nurses and about four doctors, and they're telling me everything that I had to do to the kid. And he's unconscious. He's out. And he will be out all the way back to the States. He, they were going to keep him under, and he was going to fly out in 24 hours. Uh, and they were talking about how thrilled they were. He says, this guy was in great shape. He's strong as an ox. He came through surgery great. We think we've got the infection under control. The, the, this kid's going to walk again. He's going to be great. And I'm sitting here thinking, and in my mind, my mind is screaming, but he's missing a leg. It wasn't the doctor's perspective. And the doctor actually kind of caught my body language. And he says, oh, don't worry about the leg. This kid's going to walk again. This kid's probably going to run again. And I did. I saw a picture of him a few years later, and he was indeed doing quite well. and may have actually stayed on active duty. The point was, <clears throat> it took a lot of support people to make that happen. And, 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 and I'm just so leery of, of dividing the Air Force into the operational crowd and the support crowd. I think it's a false designation. For 31 years, I flew close air support. I was a support guy. I, I think the ops and support moniker uh, offers a false distinction that is unhelpful. You want airmen to own their you want them to own their mission, you want them to own their job and feel good about what they're doing, and then get out of their way and let them go. Okay. Good, sir. We have time for one more question. Yes. Sir, Shelby Summer, Flight 15. Uh, you talked about um, knowing when to give uh, your people a leash and when to let them off it. Uh, one of the uh, themes of this year for us has been bold leadership. I was wondering if you had any views or recommendations on how we can make sure that we in, uh, encourage bold leadership in an organization that seems to be growing more risk averse. <clears throat> Show examples of it. The hardest thing to do with any organization is to change its culture. That is the most difficult thing to do. And when leadership has a two-year tour, it's really hard to change culture. Jack Welch could change GE's culture when he was the CEO for 30 years. CE arguably became Jack Welch and mirrored Jack Welch. Typically, command tours don't last that long. Uh, and, and so, in, in my mind, culture change in many ways will be top to bottom and bottom to top. And, and, and people will have to see some examples of bold leadership. Hopefully bold leadership won't get schwacked and won't, won't get their nose swatted because they practice try bold leadership. But at the same time, y you've got to let people try bold leadership. To me, this is what's harder. You've got to let people try things differently. Yeah, I want you to be bold leaders, but it'll be harder when somebody comes to you and say, hey, I got a really bold idea. Can I run with this? That's when you'll get tight-jawed. And are you willing to let them go? Uh, here's my plea to you. Have fun watching them. Uh, not everybody will get it right. Some of them are going to stub their toe. But if you can envision yourself as the one that shows people the end zone, show them the goal post, show them the sidelines, give them the left and right limits, give them the parameters, and then just get out of their way. And that's when command really gets fun, is to watch them go. And I don't mean your captains, uh-uh. I mean your senior airmen. As a wing commander, I talk to a lot of groups. I talk to FTAC, brand new one stripers walking in the door. They're afraid to open their mouth. Uh, all the way up to chief master sergeants, the professional cynics in the wing. Um, 
first sergeants, NCAA, everybody. My favorite group, my favorite group to talk to was the ALS class. Senior airmen getting ready to pin on staff sergeant. They are bold, they are ready, they are knowledgeable, and they're fearless in asking their questions. And they are ready for an opportunity to lead. And so when we do an ALS graduation, here was my plea to the crowd. I said, tonight, we've pinned stripes on them, and they are all staff sergeants. I expect them to act like NCOs. But here's, here's the transaction. It's up to us to start treating them like NCOs and letting them be NCOs and conducting themselves as NCOs. We replicate ourselves as an Air Force better than anybody. We grow the next generation of NCOs. We grow the next generation of senior NCOs. We grow the next generation of lieutenants and captains, I think, better than anybody. <clears throat> and, and if you're going to change the culture that we've got, however you want to identify it, you're going to have to do it incrementally. You, you, you don't change culture on a dime. Uh, typically, you're going to look back over your shoulder in a few years and realize that's when I think, we, that's when I think it started to turn. You're going to see it in your rearview mirror. Be bold, but more importantly, let people working for you be bold. Okay, I'm Great, over sir. time. Uh, General Johnson, we want to thank you for being with us today and sharing your experiences and leadership insights. Thank you.